Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn Treading on its Dragon's Teeth, Maine and the Slave Trade. Let me go to the next slide. We are joined by Dr. Kate McMahon, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, to explore Maine's role in the global slave trade and how African Americans in Maine resisted slavery and fought for their freedom. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations work to protect Maine's environment and our democracy by building diverse coalitions, influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Next slide. A few technical notes for today's event. You are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. You can send your questions to me, Kathleen, through the chat whenever they occur to you. Um, you can find the chat by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen. I'll keep track of the questions to ask during the Q&A session at the end. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak through the chat function and he can help you out. This event is being recorded and we will share a link to the video Later this afternoon, it'll also get posted on our website where you can find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you all for joining us and Kate, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks everybody for being here today. Let me pull up my slideshow. Okay, and I um, apologize in advance for the barking dogs in the background, uh, the realities of uh, working from home. Um, so, so thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. Uh, please definitely feel free to send questions in the chat. I'm covering a lot of geographical terrain, temporal terrain. Um, so, so there's a lot to cover in a short amount of time and um, I'm gonna do my best to, to get through it all. Um, so I have just a little bit about me. I'm originally from Maine. I uh, went to the USM for my bachelor's and my master's degree and um, Howard University in DC for my PhD. And currently I work uh, at the Center for the Study of Global Slavery at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, I'm gonna start today uh, briefly talking about the dimensions of global slavery. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, graphic to play. Um, so, so slavery, the slave trade started in the mid 16th century. Uh, and the reason why it started during this time period had a lot to do with the ability of ships to navigate the windward passage um, between the, the waters essentially between Europe and the west coast of Africa. There's obviously the jet stream, the Gulf, the Gulf Stream that uh, goes across from North America to Africa that made it very difficult for ships to pass this prior to the 16th century when they began to construct vessels that could make the passage. Um, really, the slave trade uh, takes off in earnest by the 17th, uh, by the 18th century, and you begin to see a rapid increase. You'll notice here uh, around 1700 through um, all of the 1700s. And one big thing that you'll notice here are the relatively small numbers of vessels that land in the mainland United States. Um, and if you look at the chart on the left hand side of the screen, you'll notice that only about uh, 350, uh, 300,000 uh, enslaved Africans were actually brought to the mainland North America to what would become the United States. Um, this has a lot to do with the conditions of enslavement in the United States um, versus the Caribbean and South America. And in particular, uh, as, as this turns to 1800, you're going to notice almost exclusively that vessels land in Cuba and Brazil. Um, and this is has everything to do with what was being produced by those countries. And that is sugar. Sugar is king. Well, we have king cotton in the United States, um, but sugar really was 
the driving, one of the major driving forces of the Industrial Revolution um, and global trade networks. And that really is what is driving the slave trade, particularly after 1800. And at 1808, you're going to notice it suddenly drop. There it goes. And that is because in 1808, the United States officially um, barred participation in the, uh, the slave trade. However, look at what continues to happen and look at the size, the, the size of the dots uh, in this graphic, which is from slate.com, are corollary to the numbers of people that were on each vessel. So that means during the illegal period, the post-1808 period, these vessels were containing many, many more people than they than they had previous to that. Um, and this, this has everything to do with this massive human toll um, that slavery and the, the business of slavery had on people of African descent. The average mortality rate during the, the slave trade was about 15%. Um, however, during the illegal period, it's as high as 30% or more, um, and we, we're still working out the dimensions of that particular period. Um, but really, the important thing to take away from this section is that slavery touched pretty much every continent. The only continent that really wasn't directly impacted by slavery um, and, the, and the, the systems that slavery built is Antarctica. And uh, even Australia was directly impacted by the slave trade, particularly in the later period as um, slave ships go into the Pacific and begin to transport indentured, I'll use that in quotes, indentured uh, Asian people and people from the South Pacific to uh, work in plantations uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, primarily after 1865. Um, <clears throat> so, Maine, uh, Maine was involved in the legal slave trade, the period prior to 1808. However, we don't have clear dimensions on our participation in that slave trade. Part of that, of course, has to do with the fact that we were part of Massachusetts for much of that time period. So our, our numbers are very lumped together. Um, and we, a lot of it has to do with a lack of support for this scholarship across New England institutions. Um, really, there, there hasn't been uh, a significant push for research in this area by New England researchers, or in particular in the state of Maine. Um, so up until now, we have assumed, uh, we've made a lot of assumptions about our merchant history. Um, and we've made these assumptions based upon the, the narrative that was really developed in the period just after the Civil War into the early 20th century. Um, this narrative, which put us on the right side of the Civil War, uh, partially also worked to, to distance ourselves from the business of slavery in the economy of slavery, as well as the slave trade. So we, we talk a lot about our merchant vessels in northern New England and our great clipper ships and our, our wonderful merchant histories and we have our captain's houses on our coasts and we've not really questioned what were these merchants doing. We talk about the West India trade or the Zanzibar trade. And people don't really think any deep, more deeply about what that means. What does that mean to be involved in the West India trade? What does it mean that the city of Portland in the 19th century was probably the, the one of the largest um, exporters of refined sugar, sugar products and molasses in the whole world? Who was making the sugar? Who was, who was planting the sugar? And this has everything to do, we have completely distanced ourselves from this history. We have um, our mills, of course, which deeply, deeply uh, were invested in the business of slavery. And, and one thing we've not really considered is what our merchant ships were doing. Mer there really isn't, there are very few vessels that were built specifically to be slave ships. The majority of slave ships also transported all kinds of other things. They transported lots of other cargo. So we we think that um, you know these these vessels that we these these heroic ships that we have have um, put up put high on pedestals in in Maine are separate from this history, but they're really not. 
because many of these ships, while they were transporting cotton between Natchez, Mississippi and Baltimore or Boston, were also transporting enslaved African Americans as part of the domestic slave trade. Uh, which was legal in the United States. So there was a huge movement, particularly after the end of the foreign slave trade between the upper South and the lower South uh, of enslaved people. At least a million people were moved this way. We don't have clear dimensions on, on the numbers of people that were moved in this coastwise slave trade yet. Although there is a database that's launching in 2021 that might help us understand these, this history a little deep, more deeply. Uh, but it's clear uh, if you look at the manifests of many of our famous um, ship owners and shipbuilders, like the Soul family of Freeport, that they actually were transporting enslaved people as well as other cargo. Um, so how what how are we defining what a slave ship is, and how can we um, shift our understanding of of our complicity in slavery, and what does that mean in New England? Uh, and and one of the things I am beginning to, to argue as I understand this history a little more is that we have our own slave society in New England. It's just that our slave society, our, our involvement in slavery didn't happen as much in our region. We were participating, Maine merchants were participating in slavery elsewhere, but that money is still flowing back to New England. And these are people who are our most notable citizens. So they are establishing laws. What does that mean for free people of color in, in Northern New England who have to navigate these very restrictive laws that are being placed upon them by people who are participating in the enslavement of people of color elsewhere? So after 1808, um, the, the slave trade was officially abolished, abolished by the United States. Um, <clears throat> however, it did not stop. And as you saw in that graphic, it actually increased. Um, so the numbers of people that were transported increased dramatically after 1808, particularly the period after uh, 1830 till the, the Civil War. Um, but the majority of these, this activity happened elsewhere. So it was American merchants, ship captains, and vessels that were trading enslaved people to Cuba and, and South America and other places uh, in the Americas. Uh, and this has a lot to do with naval law, merchant history, um, American, the number, one of these reasons is that American ports were traf, uh, were largely patrolled by various port authorities. Um, so, so Navy vessels, you know, port vessels, they had, um, you know, you had to pay tariffs and taxes and various things when you entered the port. Um, so it was difficult for them to hide uh, enslaved people coming into ports. That does not mean it didn't happen. Um, and there certainly were illegal journeys that, that landed in the United States. The most famous one is, is one I work on for the Slavex Project called Africa Town. The ship was called the Clotilda, which landed in uh, Mobile, Alabama in 1862. Uh, and the, the man that owned that was owned by two brothers, the Maher brothers, who were actually originally from Maine. And these men moved to Mississippi and started to um, build steamships and other vessels to transport lumber and, and passengers up the Mississippi River. And they bet um, some other slaveholders in Mississippi that they could bring a ship and successfully land a cargo of people in, uh, in Mobile, and they did. And that group of people went on to found the Africatown community, which is still um, has many des descendants of this original group of people that survived the Clotilda. Um, so this was not something that didn't happen. However, our participation in the transportation of enslaved Africans to other places, to Cuba and Brazil primarily, was much greater than the transportation of enslaved Africans back to the United States. Um, in 1820, at the same time period that our uh, that our state was was being decided, that Maine statehood was being um, debated during the same Congress, they were also debating whether or not to impose stricter um, penalties on people participating caught, uh, in the slave trade. And this was because after 1808, before 1820, it was 
mayhem. It didn't stop, really. Uh, we, we, we know that the slave trade increased dramatic, dramatically during this time period, and we know that there was deeply increased traffic. We have very little documentary evidence. Uh, and I'll talk about this uh, a little bit in a couple slides, but essentially it's because um, the, the documents themselves that I am working with for the illegal period are only of people who got caught. So I have the tip of the iceberg and whatever is under here are people that never got caught. And so when I get, to, when I get a little forward, you'll see that the numbers that I have found and we can think about how big the iceberg under the water actually is. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about this through, through the story of one particular shipbuilder from Brunswick um, named Joseph Badger. Badger um, is from the Badger family of, of Portsmouth uh, and, and you know, that part of New Hampshire, uh, Seacoast, New Hampshire. Uh, very famous family. There's Badger Island in the Piscataqua River. Um, so, you know, Badger eventually relocates as a young man relocates to Brunswick. Um, as well as his brother, and lived on Main Street. You can see uh, N. Badger, uh, that his house there on this map and on the right hand side. Um, Joseph lived with his brother Nathaniel after uh, his house burned in 1845. Uh, so Badger was a merchant and a shipbuilder. Um, he, he becomes a very kind of prominent citizen in Brunswick, um, but was, you know, of relatively modest means uh, prior to the 1830s. Um, he's, he initially begins to build ships, and the first vessel he builds is the Porpoise, um, which was 160 tons, and tonnage has to do with the amount of cargo uh, a ship could hold. So it could hold 160 tons of cargo, and that was the standard way of measuring a vessel. Uh, still is. Um, you don't measure it by, you, by how much it actually, it itself weighs. Um, so so the Porpoise was built uh, in 1839 in Brunswick, um, and in its first journeys ends up going to Brazil um, as well as other places in um, South and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but on its first trip in 1841 on its way to Brazil, it also transported um, 40 some odd people from Baltimore to New Orleans as part of the um, illicit, uh, the, the legal slave trade, the domestic slave trade in the United States. Um, so this was both a domestic slave vessel as well as a, an illegal foreign slave vessel. Um, they made multiple journeys to Africa and Angola and um, some of the sea islands off of Africa, Sao Tome and Principe, um, which were suspect but not confirmed slave journeys. Um, and then they made a final journey in which everyone was arrested. And I'll get to that in a minute. He also built um, a brig called the Malaga, which is a very tantalizing name if you know anything about main history and Malaga Island and the fact that the Malaga was built um, at least the, uh, the island was named Malaga when this was built. Whether or not there were African Americans living on Malaga Island uh, in the in the early 1840s is undetermined currently. Um, the, the earliest known person to live out there is in the 1860s. However, um, it certainly is likely to be named after the island. Maybe it's just because he, you know, saw the island in the New Meadows. Uh, but in 1846, the vessel um, was captured off of Angola um, and released because they had not yet taken enslaved people on board. It was captured by the British um, Africa Squadron, which was a group of Briti British naval vessels that were patrolling off of Africa. Um, it, it comes back to the United States, is um, the, the captain is charged, the vessel is sold, the captain is eventually acquitted, um, which happens pretty much consistently during this time period. Everyone is acquitted. So I will talk about the only person to really be convicted and face harsh penalties. Um, so, so 
1847, the vessel turns around and uh, goes back to Sierra Leone and is captured off of the coast of Sierra Leone with 900 people on board, 300 of which had already suffocated. So people actually suffocated to death in the hold before it ever left the coast of Africa. So when I was talking about these high mortality rates during this time period, this has a lot to do with this desperation of these slave uh, traders attempting to get as many people on board these vessels as possible you know, consequences to human life be damned. Um, so eventually um, that vessel, the, the people on that vessel that survived were brought to Sierra Leone and became um, members of Freetown, which is a, a liberated African community. Um, however, of course, this still means that wherever these people originally came from, they never got to go home for the most part. Most of them stayed in, in, in uh, Sierra Leone uh, and were never allowed to return to their homes. He also um, eventually in, in the, uh, builds the Rebecca. After these two successful journeys, he builds this 534 ton vessel. So you can see he makes all this money. In the same time period, he is also um, uh, elected the, the head of the Pajep Scott Bank. He is, um, he is raising, rising in status and stature in, in um, Brunswick. Um, and Rebecca um, goes to goes to Cuba and um, successfully lands um, some 400 people uh, in Cuba in the 1850, late 1850s. He also was part owner of a ship called the Crimea, which was from Bath, which transported 700 captive Africans to Cuba in 1857. So these are the ones I know about. He may have, I know he owned other vessels. I don't know exactly what those vessels were up to. The one I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about today is the Porpoise. Um, so the Porpoise was, was owned um, by George F. Richardson um, and Joseph Badger. It was moderately sized at 160 tons. It was very rakish. So what that means is that it was slim um, and fast. And so it could navigate quickly. And that was one of the reasons why New England vessels in particular were preferred by Brazilian and Cuban slave traders during this time period. We, we had the best ships, right? We all know that our ships were superior. Well, this is part of the reason why our technology, the technology of shipbuilding was adapting so quickly was to outrun naval vessels. Um, so the, the Porpoise in 1841 left Baltimore loaded with 106 enslaved people bound for New Orleans. Um, so that group of people was, was brought to New Orleans and sold in New Orleans as um, a part of the American domestic slave trade. Um, then it, on its return journey in 1843, um, it goes to Sao Tome and Principe. And these are journeys that I am not 100% positive for slave trading journeys. However, the vessel was consigned, meaning leased, by the most notorious slave trader in Brazil during this time period. So the evidence, they also came back with no cargo. So when a vessel comes back with a lot of gold, no cargo, and has been consigned by a slave trader, we can, with this circumstantial evidence, assume that this was a slave trading journey. Um, so in 1844, it goes again to, um, to, uh, to, to Brazil. And this time it is consigned with a group of other, Amer four other American vessels. Um, on behalf of this same slave trader, um, Manuel Pinto da Fonseca. <clears throat> Fonseca was deeply, deeply involved in the slave trade, particularly to Rio de Janeiro. He was um, the most prominent slave trader in all of Rio de Janeiro. Um, so in 1844, these vessels depart together. Um, the Kentucky, which you saw on this previous slide, was one was the largest vessel that um, went with the porpoise and the porpoise was acting as its tender, meaning that the porpoise was primarily contain, contained supplies 
um, guns, trade items. They, we know that they brought with them cotton cloth as well as other what they called Yankee goods. So manufactured goods that um, they could trade in Africa. And they patrolled the coast of Mozambique, um, modern day Mozambique, looking for enslaved people. And they were actually there for um, nine months. So the vessels were actually assumed to be lost at some point. And so there's a lot of communication between George Richardson in Maine. Um, most of these documents come from the Maine Historical Society, if anyone is interested in looking, up, looking them up. Um, George Richardson, there's a lot of communication between him and the merchant firm that had consigned the, the, the vessel, Maxwell Wright and Company, which was an American merchant house in Brazil that was essentially arranging all of these illicit slave trade journeys for Fonseca. Um, they thought the vessels were lost, but actually it was because during this time period, it was very difficult to find enough slaves to purchase, enslaved people to purchase, to make a journey profitable. So they were really looking for um, the, you know, if you look at these numbers, a lot of captive people to fit on these vessels. Um, so in total, approximately 1800 people were taken aboard these vessels. Um, and one of these people is this man you see on the left hand side of the screen. His name was Pedro Tovucan. Um, his, his African name is Tovucan, um, but he was given the name Pedro after he was purchased um, by a, a Portuguese slave trader in Africa. And he actually is one of the three captive, young captive African children children, he was 13 years old, uh, taken aboard the porpoise. Um, and he was taken specifically as well as his brother Luis and another boy named Guillermo because he could speak Portuguese. Um, and he was actually Portuguese uh, by, the, by the, the Portuguese slave trader that had purchased him in Mozambique. Um, so Pedro has left a really remarkable archive and we really don't have any other stories as, as rich as this when it comes to New England and enslavement. Um, and his, he was um, essentially a, a adopted by Virgil Paris, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. But he talks about in um, his oral history that was recorded by his adoptive brother, uh, about his capture. And we really don't have very many narratives out there from people who actually were in the slave trade, particularly during this time period, that describe their home, their capture, and their family. And so he talks about um, where he was from, it's somewhere in the interior of Zanzibar, uh, which is essentially uh, the land that is at northern Mozambique it, to, to modern day Tanzania. Um, likely he is Mozambican. Um, he certainly was a Swahili speaker. I had the opportunity to present this work when I was in Mozambique a couple of years ago. And um, there's a song that's transcribed in phonetically and we were able to figure out that it's likely Swahili. So we're trying to determine what it actually, the song might have originally said. But he was attacked, His like many people, um, his, his group was, his family was attacked by a neighboring group of people. Um, uh, and he and his family were actually uh, taken in, in as part of this violence, which is, a, tends to be how most people end up in the slave trade during this time period is between, um, through war and that kind of thing. Um, so when Pedro was uh, the next day after Pedro's family was attacked, um, he, he, uh, he discovered that his brother was also taken captive um, and, and that his, his mother, his grandmother and his father had been killed and he had never heard, um, he never heard from the rest of his family again. So after he was uh, sold, he was brought to Inyaka Island, which is off of the coast of Maputo, which is in southern Mozambique. It's the capital of Mozambique. And there he was um, eventually purchased by Fonseca and this other group of people. Um, <clears throat> so 
the Kentucky uh, and the porpoise landed on Inyaka Island around the 20th of May, 1844. Um, and there Fonseca met with um, the other Brazilian slave traders who were there and met a, a quote, Negro king who kept a depot of blacks for slaves sent down to him from Lorenzo Marques, which is at the big, uh, uh, in northern Mozambique, uh, former uh, Portuguese colonial city, uh, end quote. <clears throat> so these, these he, Pedro was sold with his brother Luis uh, and was to be the personal attendant of Fonseca. Um, and his brother was to be the personal attendant of the supercargo, which is essentially the, the captain above all the other individual captains. He's kind of arranging the captains, coordinating the captains. Um, and for he was purchased for Cinco Dineros, five half gold doubloons on Inyaka Island. Um, so the porpoise in the Kentucky traveled up and down the coast of Mozambique. Um, the porpoise would essentially, because it was a smaller vessel, um, it would navigate the smaller interior rivers where a lot of these slave markets were and, um, and bring them out to the Kentucky where the people were kept. Um, and finally, in, in the fall of um, 1844, uh, the vessels had enough enslaved people, according to, to um, Fonseca, to leave Mozambique. Um, and like many slave journeys, there was resistance to this by the enslaved people on board the Kentucky. Um, and you can see on the left-hand screen, I'm not going to read it out, but um, there was a serious slave revolt aboard the vessel and approximately 50 people were killed by the Brazilians as a result, at, for, as reprisal for what they had done, that they had essentially tried to resist their enslavement and killed in a very grotesque and horrific ways. Um, <clears throat> so, after this incident, there was very little, um, very little trouble. Um, a free black cook named Peter Johnson, who was aboard the, um, the Kentucky, who was from Kingston, New York, described the moment when Pedro and Louise were put onto different ships for the transatlantic journey. Pedro stayed on the porpoise and Louise was sent to the Garofilia. Um, and this is a quote from his testimony, from Johnson's testimony. He says, Captain Lorenz came on board the porpoise at Lorenzo Marquez with Captain Paulo, Mr. Vieira, and a Negro boy named Pedro, and also another ne Negro boy who went in the porpoise to Imyak. And there was put on board a vessel called the Garofilia, then lying in a river, hid for fear of the English. This boy was brother to Pedro and looked much like him, and both boys cried a good deal when they parted. You know, evidence like this really shows you, I think, just how destructive this was. These were children. They were 13, 14 years old when this happened to them. So the, the, the rest of the journeys were relatively um, uneventful and eventually they arrived back in Brazil. And um, in Brazil, um, during that time period. In 1842, the United States had, had um, signed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which um, one of the things that that treaty with Great Britain, one of the things that that treaty did was establish the, um, an Africa squadron that uh, the United States would fund. Until this point, the United States had no dedicated vessels to patrol looking for American ships uh, participating in the slave trade. They were using other Navy vessels. It was inconsistent. And the British um, were deeply troubled by the numbers of American vessels that were showing up in ports, all in slave ports all over the world. And so the United States agreed to, um, to launch some vessels. The first one was the USS Saratoga that was built in Kittery. Um, the second vessel was this vessel the, on the bottom left uh, image, the USS Raritan, which was built in Philadelphia. And you can see just how well gunned it is. It has two rows of guns, you know, tons of cannons on both sides. It's 
very large vessel. And so this vessel um, was being commanded um, by a man named Commodore Turner in, in Rio de Janeiro during this time period. <clears throat> and the, the Brazilians, of course, were plenty aware of the Americans and the British that were looking for them, uh, particularly since this, this journey was overdue. They were being watched by the American consul at Rio, a man named George William Gordon, who was from Boston. He was an abolitionist and he was using his time in, in Rio to, um, to look for Americans, particularly New Englanders that were participating in this trade. Um, and you can see this quote on the bottom um, from Henry Wise, who was the minister plenipotentiary to, to Brazil during this time period. He says, sir, the African slave trade thickens around us and we are treading on its dragon's teeth. It is not to be denied, and I boldly assert it, that the administration of the imperial government of Brazil is forcibly constrained by its influences and is deeply inculpated in its guilt. Um, this is a whole network of bribery, of course, happening. There's, there's lots of backhanded deals that are fueling the slave trade, both in New England and, at, and abroad. Um, so, so during this time period, because of the fact that they couldn't land in Rio de Janeiro, many of these slave vessels were landing in a place called Cabo Frio, which is very far east of Rio de Janeiro. It's about as far east uh, into the Atlantic as you can get in, um, in that part of Brazil. Uh, it is a very dangerous place to land a ship. It is rocky. Um, there's tons of shipwrecks there. However, it was, um, it, it, and because of this, the British in particular would not go near there. They had, had lost a ship, the HMS Thetis, in the 1830s there, trying to chase a slave ship and lost a ton of cargo. And it was a huge effort to, to get back all of the silver and things like that that were wrecked there. Um, and another reason why that this area was chosen was because um, Fonseca actually owned a plantation and auction facility himself in Ponto da Caju, which is uh, north of Cabo Frio. Um, so, so Fonseca actually, you know, really had a whole corner on this market. He had a sugar plantation, he auctioned people, and he also traded people. Um, so just on this one journey alone, Fonseca made the equivalent of $20 million. Um, that was how much he was making on average for uh, one of these journeys during the year, uh, during any given year in the 1840s. So the porpoise, uh, the, all of the vessels except the porpoise sell all of their cargo, uh, enslaved cargo in, um, in Cabo Frio. The porpoise still had Pedro and Guillermo on board. And so the vessels returned to Rio de Janeiro um, uh, uh, about a few weeks after selling all of these people and the USS Raritan is ready for them. And they, the Raritan pulls up next to, um, and next to the Kentucky and Peter Johnston, uh, the free black cook wrote a note that said there are two enslaved boys hidden aboard the porpoise and threw it on board the Raritan. The Raritan stopped the Kentucky and the other vessels. They were, they were all boarded and the porpoise um, and Pedro and Guillermo were discovered. Um, and Luis, his brother, was also uh, discovered aboard the Guerrafilia. And um, the, the captains and the crews were all arrested. And what essentially transpires from here is a very intense and drawn out political moment between Brazil and the US essentially over rights of search and seizure. Uh, and eventually all of the money, uh, all of the gold that had been that had been taken is is disappears into Brazil. The Brazilian crews are let go. And um, uh, but Cyrus Libby, the captain, was taken to Maine and was um, tried. Uh, and Pedro, who uh, I'll go back to his image, was brought aboard the porpoise to Maine um, and eventually is adopted by Virgil Paris. 
Um, and Pedro goes on. Uh, Gordon, unfortunately, gets into a lot of trouble over the way that he handled this situation, primarily because it was during uh, Tyler's administration and Tyler was no fan of the abolitionists. So um, eventually Gordon loses his job, goes back to Massachusetts and runs for governor in the 1850s. And Pedro goes on a whistle stop train of Massachusetts with him and actually um, uh, petitions for him to become governor. Gordon is unsuccessful, um, but, but Pedro, you know, clearly was deeply involved in uh, abolitionism abroad and at home. Um, and Cyrus Libby never faces any charges. Nobody in Maine ever, ever actually is, um, suffers any penalty for, for this uh, journey, even though there are a number of crew members as well that are from Maine. Um, so Badger goes on to build that, that very large vessel, the, the Rebecca, uh, in, 18, in the 1850s. Um, and this really has, you know, the, the, the spatial dimensions begin to shift. And so we see a huge uptick in the number of main slave vessels that are going to Cuba in the 1850s in particular. After 1850, Brazil finally began to put down the slave trade, uh, the foreign slave trade, even though it had been technically illegal there for 20 years. And so everyone, all of these merchants to shift to Cuba and Cuba is lawless, totally lawless when it comes to the slave trade during this time period. Um, and if you look here, this, these are vessels that I know for a fact were, were engaged in the slave trade. Um, the average uh, journey netted profits of $3.1 million in today's currency for owners back in the, the United States. So we can see why so many people were participating in this slave trade, uh, because all of this money is flowing back to New England. Um, the New York Times estimated the value of New England's slave feet, fleet in 1857 at 11 million, which equates to $332 million today. Though this is just that tip of the iceberg that we know about. So the true uh, you know, some of the real economic bedrock of Northern New England was being fueled by this. These guys were the presidents of our banks. They were our most notable citizens. Um, and I'll just close with it, with quickly talking about one other um, vessel that that was uh, owned by Badger. Badger was involved in the uh, American colonization movement, which was. Uh, the American Colonization Society was founded in the early 19th century um, to bring free African Americans back to Africa. <clears throat> Some of these people voluntarily wanted to go back to Africa, but many of them, particularly by the 1850s, had no choice in the matter. When slaveholders in the South died and chose to manumit or give their in, um, enslaved people freedom, they had to provide for them in some way. One way that they could easily provide for them was to provide for them to get on a ship and go back to Africa. Whether or not these people wanted to go back to Africa. And remember that by this time period, everybody you see here on this list was born in the United States. So these are Americans going back to a completely foreign place to which they have, you know, no, um, many people died of disease and, and things like that. Um, so in 1859, a slaveholder uh, in uh, John McDonough, um, who lived in New Orleans, um, passed away and manumitted these 41 people that you see on the right hand side of the screen. These people were uh, to be taken on the Rebecca by, by Captain Carter to Liberia. However, Captain Carter had other plans. Because of the slave trade in Cuba, he knew, and I suspect that there's a much bigger traffic than, than what we currently know about in this, he knew that he could sell these people for a huge profit, $12,000 per person, uh, which is a significant amount of money for a ship captain to make. And you know, it's not like the agents back in New Orleans care what happens to them as long as they're gone. So Carter uh, is, is trying to do this and is discovered by the ship surgeon. And the ship surgeon makes enough of a stink about it. And you can see here on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, this newspaper articles, 
that he um, does indeed, Carter does indeed bring everyone to Liberia and they successfully become part of the community in Freetown. However, immediately after that, the Rebecca sails down the coast of Liberia and purchases 400 enslaved people and lands them in, in Cienfuegos, Cuba. Uh, and the vessel is destroyed. And so this is just one of many, many um, incidents like this across New England. If you look back here at my, my chart, you know, uh, for, I've been able to, to discover at least, actually these numbers I've updated it since then, approximately 18,000 captive Africans um, uh, were transported during this time period by main ships alone. And that's not to account for all of the other New England vessels, particularly Massachusetts had as much of a um, as much of an involvement as in this as us. And so, you know, I really um, I was asked to give a call to action today. And, and one thing that I'm really um, passionate about in my work at the Center for the Study of Global Slavery um, is the work that we do in Mozambique. Um, I'm part of the team that is working with colleagues in uh, the National Museum of Mozambique to develop some of these stories, in particular Pedro stories, to become part of their um, history there in their museums and, and so that people can learn about them, particularly young people, that, that their people lived these remarkable lives um, uh, in the past and, you know, survived through all of these horrific things. Um, and, and many people, particularly in the United States, do not know right now that there is an ongoing humanitarian crisis in Mozambique. Um, Mozambique had, uh, within the last few years, a large um, offshore gas discovered deposit. Uh, there was there was a whole uh, controversy over who would get the contract and eventually it went to Exxon Mobil, which caused outrage among Mozambican citizens and um, has thus led to significant political destabilization in the country, particularly in the northern part of Mozambique where um, this, this was, the gas deposit was discovered. And um, currently ISIS, given this opportunity, ISIS has made a massive um, inroads in northern Mozambique. Um, a couple of weeks ago, 50 people were beheaded and so far half a million people have been displaced in Mozambique. Um, and have fled to Tanzania or into uh, southern parts of Mozambique. So there really is an ongoing humanitarian crisis there. Last year, they had two category five cyclones hit Mozambique from which they did not recover. Um, There's outbreaks of polio, dysentery, all kinds of other you know, preventable diseases. And this has gotten almost no um, movement in international media. And so I really, you know, if, if you take one thing away today, please consider contacting your representatives, particularly since Angus King may have an important role in the new, in the new uh, Biden administration. You know, please contact your representatives and encourage them to provide aid and relief and support to the people of Mozambique. Um, because, you know, this is something that's deeply important, I think, that we recognize not only um, the, the importance of supporting these, these people, but also our role historically and the reason why this, this country is so disenfranchised and so um, and has so many political problems. And so uh, I guess we have about 10 minutes for questions. I, I, I see that some have popped into the chat, so I don't know. Um, Kate, if you could uh, stop your screen for a second and I'll take over um, and just, I'll also say wow and, and uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this. This is one of our best presentations ever. So, uh, yeah, I think yeah. we're, I can certainly say I am blown away by not just the content, but, but by the research that you have done and just so grateful uh, that you're sharing it with us today. Uh, we obviously have a lot of learning still to do. And so that everybody on the call knows, uh, we'll send out a link later this afternoon with, um, some of you may have joined us for a, a Lunch and Learn back in July with the Atlantic Black Box Project, uh, which is also digging into New England's role in global slavery. And um, some of the questions that have come in today were very similar to the ones that, that we asked in that presentation, which is, you know, 
why didn't we know this? And, and what do we do now that we do know? Um, so we'll send out a link to the Atlantic Black Box as well as a couple of um, the Indigo Arts Alliance, which is which is based here in Portland and uh, really has a, a unique perspective on the role of artists in strengthening our democracy. Uh, and then I'll also share a link to some articles about that ongoing crisis in Mozambique. Uh, again, this is, this is both history and current events that a lot of us don't know. Um, so, so Kate, just a tiny question. Why don't we know this? <laughs> well, I mean, that is really the interesting thing. Um, because this was all over the newspapers. So it's not like I'm digging that hard to find this stuff. I honestly, you could Google any of this. I'm finding most of this in Google books. A lot of this, this was well known at the time. Some of these, uh, I didn't mention um, George, uh, Nathaniel Gordon, but the only person to ever actually be executed by the United States government for participation in the slave trade was from Portland, Nathaniel Gordon, who was the captain of the Erie. And in 1862, he was executed by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so, well, not by Lincoln, by, by Lincoln's administration, uh, and, and for outfitting uh, a slave vessel that went to Cuba. During the same time period, Appleton Oaksmith, who was the son of Seba Smith, who was the, the editor of the Eastern Argus, was also arrested for attempting to outfit a slave vessel. And it was a huge scandal. It was in all the papers. Um, so I really think this has everything to do with the way that we have revised our own history to make it more comfortable as white people. This is an uncomfortable history, not only to, to think about just what your ancestors may have done and how they may have participated in this, but also what does that mean for you today and what does it mean for people today? And so I really think that it's, it's just deeply important that we come to grips with this as a, uh, as a region. We understand it, we revisit I, a lot of this is also in, this is institutional racism that is baked into our archives, into our historical societies, into our museums, into our classrooms. So it really is going to take a lot of work um, on behalf of of you know white allies, especially, to confront this and to force our to to force our region to really begin to reckon with our history and what that means and how we might find ways of reparative justice in this. Um, whether that's just acknowledging that this happens, whether that's, um, you know, supporting renaming because many of our places in Maine are named after slaveholders. I hate to tell you guys, slaveholders and slave traders. We've got a whole county named after one. So, you know, this is, this is something that's deeply important for us, I think, to acknowledge. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I do wonder, you know, is it safe to assume that um, that our shipbuilders, our ship owners, and captains were all involved in the slave trade? Or is that? Um, I wouldn't say they're all involved. Um, I would say that they um, there is, we are complicit. Everyone is complicit because it's all part of the same economy. We can't continue to separate the merchant economy from the economy of slavery. They're not different. They're the same thing. It's all part of the same the same economy. You know, you can't talk about cotton trade without thinking about slavery, and you can't you can't talk about any of this without thinking about particularly when you're in the industrial revolution would not have happened without the expansion of slavery globally, and so you know I think it's it's less placing blame on the past but more recognizing that we have system this is part of systemic racism this is part of it and this is what you know why is Maine so white is a question that comes up a lot and I think I think we had our own slave society here and then actually we were more effective at segregation than the south was 
uh, and and it was just de facto segregation. It just worked differently. It wasn't it wasn't legal segregation necessarily, it, although sometimes it was. Um, but there was, you know, this this deep complicity in and this is something that even the Southerners were calling out. You know, in Congress, you see all these Southerners in the 1850s saying, oh, these, these hypocritical Northerners, they don't care, you know, they want to end slavery here, but they, meanwhile, they're selling Africans in Cuba. We have to reckon with this history. And, and until we really understand that some of this iceberg that's underneath the water, I mean, we're starting to understand this tip through projects like the Atlantic Black Box, through slavewages.org, some of these other um, public history projects that are happening, but there's still a whole iceberg under here. And it, some of this might rest in family archives. You know, a lot of it probably does. And, and in these secrets that have been repeated uh, historically. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that everyone can can think about how you know you you can engage in this history you can pick up a rock where you are and start to turn that rock over you know if there's a captain's house in your town and you're like you know that was built in 1842 and it says that guy went to brazil i wonder what he was doing there you might be able to figure it out and and i encourage you to if you do find things to please send it to me to send it to the atlantic black box we are you know in the process of creating a a, a database a new england uh slavery records database with um a group of people at the john jay college in new york um that will you know hopefully in the next couple of years go live but in the meantime you know we can find ways to get this information out there to people Kate, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate that reminder that as, as much as our ancestors and our, our history, we have been complicit in, in this, we can also all be part of the repair work. Uh, and, and that is really, uh, I think that's the, the place that helps me go from the overwhelming nature of this history to, to some action. Uh, there are dozens of fabulous questions. Really, we should have blocked this out, not for a lunch and learn, but for like a whole week and learn. <laughs> uh, but I will remind everybody that this is gonna be, this was recorded. You can share it with, with friends and family. That's maybe one of a, the first steps. Uh, there are also some other lunch and learns on our website and we're, we're working on pulling those together into nice little playlists. So you can go back and, find the black box theory uh, project easily from here. Uh, and come next week, because at first blush, next week's topic, which is about um, broadband and the, the fight to connect all main people might seem really different than this. But Kate, if I heard you right, internet access is a key part to us being able to do this work together. So uh, join us next week. We'll have Nick Batista from uh, the Island Institute talking about the, the Connect Me authorities work to extend broadband throughout the state so that we can all uh, pick up those rocks and, and Google what we found underneath them. Mm -hmm. uh, I am Immensely grateful to you, Kate. Immensely grateful to all of you for joining. Lots of new names on today's uh, webinar and can't wait to see you again and to keep doing this work with you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions that I didn't get to answer. <laughs>